turn with me in your Bible to the book of Romans. We are in chapter 1. Now listen, we're going to be in chapter 1 and 2 for a little bit because it's the foundation of the rest of the book. And uh, we want to make sure we get that squared up. And uh, let's start off with a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the people that are here. I want to thank you for those who have, who have been restored after having the COVID for a number of weeks. And Father, we just thank you for the wonderful way you have made us that our bodies adjust to things that come against it. Father, I want to thank you for the good news and the reports that are coming out that the herd immunity is finally kicking in. And Father, we just ask that you would just continue to show yourself strong on behalf of this church. I pray that you would just watch over and protect. I pray that you'd be with me, that you would guard my heart, help me to uh, do what is right. And Father, I pray that you'd help us as we hear your word and the message from it, that we will hear from your spirit to convict us and challenge us and to encourage us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I picked my grandchild up this week from school, and I was taking her home. I don't know if you've ever been riding in a car, you're watching the road, and the passenger next to you starts to scream. It's a little scary, and then I was trying to figure out what she was screaming at, and she's pointing, and I'm looking for an accident, a car out of control. I didn't know what it was, but it was the smallest spider I'd ever seen in my life on the windshield. <laughs> Now, at first, I was amazed that it was holding on so well, but she wasn't calming down. And I said, Mia, it's, it's, it's outside, sweetie. It's not, look, I touched it, it's outside. She's got tears running down. I said, you know what? After this next light, the wind's going to blow that spider off. It didn't. <laughs> it, it climbed up and disappeared over the top of the car. Now, listen, I was stupid. The women here, you're going to say, Larry, I can't believe you did that. But I didn't know, Hope. I was trying to let her know, hey, it's going to be okay. I said, sweetie, it's outside the car. I went to open the sunroof just to see. She, I didn't even open the sunroof. She lost it. Tears are streaming down. I said, Mia Corbin, calm down, sweetie. Michelle said, Dad, once she couldn't see it, it really got scary. I didn't know that because I'm a guy. I'm like out of sight, out of mind. I should have, the fear should have gone away. She cried from the high school all the way to Sunnyside. Couldn't catch her breath. And I got, a, as a man, we try to fix stuff. I said, sweetie, this is ridiculous. You need to calm down. She said, Augie, I have been terrified of spiders since I was a baby. And I said, no, you haven't, because when you were young, I told you one day, Mia, don't move. There's a spider there. Don't touch it. And out of spite, you went over and touched it. So don't tell me you've always been scared of a spider. She said, I did that? I said, yeah, you did that. Well, she kind of laughed at that. I said, what is going on with this spider, sweetie? Now, I'm scared my granddaughter's going to have a phobia of spiders the rest of her life, and I'm, I want to get this fixed today, because that's what men do. And she had had a dream. And it was a horrible dream. She was in her old house. She was out in the family room. I was there. Mimi was there. Nana was there. Vincent, uh, Michelle. I can't remember if Nikki and Tyler were there. But apparently all of us had been killed by a giant spider that was coming down the hall toward her. And it was going to eat her. And that was her dream. And because of that dream... She is terrified of this teeny little spider. So we began to talk about it, began to try to do some, some thinking, adjusting in her head to help her realize, hey, this is an irrational fear. You can't say that that way to a six-year-old. But began to talk to her about it, disclose some truth, and she was, she was better. Now, she's still going to be scared of spiders. I know that. But she went into the house and said, can I tell Dad everything? I said, you go tell Dad everything, sweetie. She said, Dad. Augie has something he needs to tell you. Go ahead, tell him, Augie. <laughs> now listen, 
she concluded every spider on the planet would eat her. Now, was that a rational fear? It wasn't a rational fear. Totally irrational. I even told her, I said, sweetie, look how small that spider is. All you have to do is gone. It's dead. Its life is over. And uh, we have irrational fears. It's faulty thinking. And there's also another way of fault, having faulty thinking. That's just being in total denial. But if we can accept the truth, the truth sets us free. Many of us have things that we think in our heart. They're either true or they're a lie. And the Bible says, what a man thinks in his heart, the very core of his being, so he is. And then God tells us some things to change the faulty thinking. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Psalm 119.11, the psalmist says, your word I've hidden in my heart, so I might not sin against you. Our heart can really trick us, just like it tricked Mia with that spider. She believed in the core of her being, every spider on the planet was going to kill her whole family and then eat her. But where did those thoughts come from? A dream? Think of all the voices that are coming at us every day. TV, radio, podcast, movies, every day. And those things go into our heart and convince us of things that may or may not be true. And then we see the world from that. I want to show you this passage because we're going to deal with two questions today. Because the way people see these two things really shape how they see God. And there are two questions I hear all the time. And the reason we're sharing this today is I want you all to be able to leave here either having those questions answered or being able to share it with somebody that's asking you. Here's the first one. Why would God send people to hell at all? That's going to shape the way you see God. The second question is, well, what happens to those that live in the jungles of South America that have never heard about Jesus Christ? Why would God send them to hell? And what it does, it shapes our way we see God. Is, is God good, compassionate, and just, and fair, and merciful? Or is he a tyrant that's just hard, hard-hearted? And, and there's all these different schools of thought in the Christian world. Some of them are like, well, that's just the way it was. Is. That's just the way it is. That's how God is. Listen, that's cold, if that's the way it is. I'll call it. Some of y'all don't have the courage. I'll say it. If that is true, God is cold. But we know God's not cold. We know that God says, it's my will that none, that means zero, that none should perish. But we also know that some will what? Will perish. It's God's will that all of us would walk in the path of righteousness for his namesake, and that he not only created us in the image of God, but he loves us so much. He's done everything in his power to eliminate this sin problem that comes between us and God. So there is a responsibility on our part. But he's done everything. And yet many will walk on that wide, winding road to destruction. Listen, by choice. So... What does Paul teach us in this chapter that helps us with those two questions? So we're going to look at that this morning. Look with me, if you will. Let's just start at verse 20. Y'all there? Chapter 1, verse 20. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible again this morning because it breaks it down. It says, For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been, what does your Bible say? clearly seen. He's hiding nothing. Everybody can see it clear as day. Clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship. Not only can it be clearly seen, it is understood. The Amplified Bible goes on to expand and say all of his creation, the wonderful things that he has made, so that they who fail to believe and trust in him so they fail to do it. They, it's, they can clearly see it. They understand it. But they fail to believe. And are without excuse and without defense. So what Paul is saying there is every man, woman, child on the planet, when they stand before God, are going to be without any excuse. Zero. 
He goes on. Verse 21. For even though they knew God as the creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks for his wonderful, uh, wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasoning and silly speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Underline that word darkened. We're going to talk about light and dark today. Their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory and majesty and excellence of an immortal God for an image of worthless idols in the shape of mortal men and birds and four-footed animals and reptiles. There's a principle in God's Word that we don't talk about a whole lot, and that is light given and darkness. There's two kingdoms. We've talked about that before. The kingdom of what? Light and the kingdom of darkness. Jesus comes into the world, and he is the light of the world. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 1, it starts off this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Talking about Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing that was made was made. That means if you're here today, you were created by Jesus himself. Makes you special. Verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It goes on to talk about that he was in the world. And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. In between those two thoughts I just read you are these verses. It says, There was a man sent from God. His name was John. This man was a witness to bear witness to the light that through him they might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man in the world. Later on in that same gospel, Gospel of John chapter 3, you all know the first two verses I'm going to share this morning, but I'm going to read you the rest. Starting in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. Verse 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is this, I'm sorry, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, and that all have been done by God. Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, the life. He also declared this, I am the light of the world. Those that do truth, walk in truth, will come to the light. But men like darkness. Now, darkness to us and darkness to God are two different things. Darkness to us is stuff we do every day. Every day. Gossiping, is that light or darkness? Listen, we do that. Slander. Do you know ever slander somebody? All right, let me put it in a different way so y'all can understand it. Do you ever share your, your perspective and your interpretation of what happened in a way that paints the other person bad? That's slander. That's light or darkness. Stealing, light or darkness. The things that we do are evil, and we like those things. No, we don't. Yes, you do. Why don't y'all stop gossiping? Well, uh, mm. why do y'all, when you're working at home, 
rig your computers to work so they think you're working so you can get your stuff done. Um, I, 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> Dean's like, how do you do that? <laughs> he loves darkness. We just, that's how we are. We, you say, no, we don't, Pastor. Yes, you do. You do. Why won't y'all go to a person and talk to them? Y'all will make up every excuse in the book. Why won't you do Matthew 18? You'll make up every excuse in the book. Why is it you lose your temper? Smack your children out of just impatience. You'll make every excuse in the book. Men love darkness rather than, say it, light. And what happens is there's a problem with mankind, and that's what Paul's trying to share with us. Jesus is the light. The truth is the light. I want to share three things with you that's going to answer these questions I shared with you and also help us to see ourselves a little bit better. You want to take some notes, write these things down. There's a divine disclosure. We talked about this last week. There's a divine disclosure. There's an outward disclosure that God gives us, and there's an inward. The outward is creation. There is no way anyone, listen to me, I'm being serious, no way anyone in their right mind can look at everything out here and say there is no God. Well, Larry, I believe in evolution. So did I. But when you start to really look at it, you have to go, something is amiss. Even now, scientists have gotten so much information on a molecular structure and a microscopic structure that they're having to admit something they don't like to admit. This could not happen randomly. This stuff couldn't happen through mutations. This stuff couldn't have happened by an accident. There is intelligent design here from everything from the DNA to how little cells move. We now know from a science level there's something more than this. And instead of saying there's a God, what they're starting to say is this. They're saying it in Hollywood. They're saying it in science articles. And they're saying it on the fringe. Aliens came and planted us here on this planet. That's suppressing truth. They say there's too much intelligent design. If you want to read a non-Christian book, a non-Christian book on this, it's called Darwin's uh, Black Box, and this guy's come out and said there's no way evolution can work. None. Well, I believe in Pit Down Man, Larry, in the transformational form. Pit Down Man now has been proven through DNA to be a tooth of a pig. We put a whole civilization together based off one tooth from a pig, and we suppress the truth. Look it up. You can find it. Let me show you how complex we are. There's so much design. Think about this for a second. The laws of nature, the laws of the universe, design, how the systems work in this world, how we're put together biologically, the precision and the order. If you took a square inch of your skin, a square inch, there's 65 hairs in that square. There's 9,500,000 cells. There's 95 to 100 different oil glands. There's nine yards of blood vessels. There's 650 sweat glands to cool your body off. There's 78 centuries to pick up heat. There's 19,500 century cells uh, that are tested nerve fibers, the end of nerve fibers. There's, one, uh, there's 1,300 nerve endings to help you record pain. There's 160 to 165 pressure apparatuses for perception of what you feel in a square inch of your skin. You cannot look at all that and go, that's amazing how that just happened. Even your eye. Y'all have heard of the retina before, right? Do you know that's just a bunch of cells that are together that take the light that is coming from outside this world and convert it to electric impulses so your brain can interpret it so you can see. It's amazing. And God says this outward testimony testifies that there is a what? A God. There's this inward testimony 
The Bible says that his law is written on our hearts and he's placed eternity in the hearts of men. When Mia was growing up and she did bad, you could tell. Even when she lied, Terry. She'd get this look on her face. What did you do? Nothing. <laughs> Where did that sense of right and wrong come from? Where did the sense of feeling bad when I do bad come from? She didn't know all the rules of life yet, but she knew that wasn't good. Why do they go behind the couch to use the bathroom when they're little? Y'all know what I'm talking about. They sneak off and they duck behind the couch. We all know what's happening. Where did that sense of shame or embarrassment or I'm doing something, where did that come from? God has written it on our hearts. Matter of fact, the next chapter it says, for the Gentiles who do not have the law, talking about the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and the law that was given to the, to the nation of Israel, <coughs> by nature do what the law requires. For they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. And their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse them or even excuse them. Have you ever been doing something wrong? Angie Stokes did something so bad today, I'm going to use her as an example. She doesn't even know it's coming. She went down to Florida. Down, down in Florida, they have all these wonderful tinted windows. Now, in the state of Virginia, the previous governor wrote a ridiculous law. You can't pull somebody over if their lights are out. You can't pull somebody over if their windows are tinted. You can't pull, and they had this list of all these things you can't be pulled over for. However, they pull you over for speeding. Then they can write you for no lights and can write you for the tinted windows. So this is, I love you. Yeah. All right. So, so she was going to get her windows tinted illegally by Virginia standards. Can you believe that? And this is what she did. She said, was it Kimberly? No, my dad. Your dad had tended it? No. You said, you said when we were over there, so-and-so did it, and they haven't been pulled. So, yeah, she, who was it? Alexis. Alexis. Alexis had hers done, and she hadn't been pulled, so it's okay for me to do it. <laughs> we excuse things that are wrong, or we get confronted with it. If we get confronted with it, we can do one of two things. We can say, this is wrong. I'm not going to do it. Or we make an excuse to justify why we can, what? Do it. Smoking, good or bad? Y'all don't want to answer because some of y'all smoke. Listen, smoking's not a sin. Is it good for you? Is it good stewardship of your body? Yeah. No, neither is drinking monster drinks or sodas or stopping at McDonald's. Let's just get it across the board. <laughs> okay? If I smoke, does it feel, Irma, does it feel good? <sighs> Man. Now listen, I go, I, I, there's times that for whatever reason, after my dad passed away, I just struggled with it. I never struggled with it like this before. But I'm struggling with it. Now, I'm not smoking. I'm not buying any. But when I'm confronted with that truth and I'm sitting at 7-Eleven and I'm buying something healthier like a donut and a soda, <laughs> and I see the cigarettes and I go, you know what? One pack won't what? That's excusing it. But I know it's not right and my conscience bothers me. It says, Larry, you do not need that. And then I choose what? Soda and the donut. And as I leave there, my conscience pricks me about that. Larry, this is way too much sugar. You're getting old, son. You can't keep this up. But I excuse that. I'll just drink a lot of water when I get home and I wash it out. It's all good. <laughs> Paul is saying, we seek the darkness 
and there's a testimony outside that says there is a God, and there's a testimony on the inside that says there is a God, and we choose to what? Either to believe it and walk in light, the truth, or reject it and excuse it away. The second part is there's a defiant denial. Listen, for even though they knew God as the creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless, with pointless reasoning and silly speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. God is very clear throughout his word that he gives all men light so that they know he is real and they know it's all right and wrong. But those that reject that will come up with pointless reasoning, silly speculations, their thinking becomes worthless, and they're disobedient, and they will not believe in God, trust in God, or give him glory. Now, he who walks in darkness, his heart will begin to harden, and it will become darkened, just like Paul said here. When we, in our unrighteousness, sin, what we're saying is, I refuse to believe the light and the truth, and I will do what I want to do. Now, the sin condition that we all have is a self-centered, self-absorbed pursuit of my will be done over God's will, and we refuse to adjust our lifestyle to the light. When we adjust our lifestyle to the truth and light, that's called repentance. I'm agreeing with God. I accept what God has said, and I say, this is wrong. I'm not going to do it, and I repent and do what God wants me to do. That's what God's looking for. And when we don't do that, we become darkened. See, people are saying this. If there is a God, then I have to adjust my life and my desires and all that to, to God. I have to repent. But they don't do that. They turn from God, become darkened, and they rebel against him. Let me just give you two since we're just talking about this, okay? Let's use one in this. I'm not picking on anybody, but this is something we all struggle with. Let's use forgiveness. We all struggle with this. The thing I hear more counseling about is, is spousal and forgiveness. Those are the two biggies. And the reason we don't forgive, now listen, does God's word tell us to forgive? Yes. Absolutely. But we choose not to. Now why do we choose not to? Give me some answers. I'm going to let you all participate this morning. We don't, want to. we don't want to. Thank you. Some honesty. I don't want to. That's the root of sin. I don't want to. Here's another reason. They'll get away with it if I forgive them. I want them to know they did wrong. Listen, they know they did wrong because their conscience is speaking to them already. No, I want to be God's instrument of justice and make them know it's wrong. <laughs> but the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and he's going to use me. <laughs> now listen, we all struggle with this. Let's just be honest. But listen, we know it in our heart. God gives testimony, and listen, we'll either hold a grudge or slander or get angry or turn bitter. Now when we turn bitter, the Bible says we start to defile many people. We tell everybody how bad they are. We tell them what they did. We make up stories to, to assassinate their character. And we start to defile many people. And listen, we become unhappy. We can't sleep. We seek to numb the pain through whatever we want to use, whether it's a cigarette or donuts. We're miserable. And we make other people miserable. And we isolate ourselves. Darkness leads to more what? But... He who chooses to walk in the truth or walk in the light, to him, God will give more light. And listen, we've all been there. I'm not busting on any one person. There was a time in my life where I just really could not forgive somebody. I just couldn't. And, and I, I had all these horrific thoughts, and it was killing me. And then God did an intervention in my life to help me because he knew where my heart was. I said, God, I want to. I just can't. Help me. And so God did. And when I forgave them, 
then I understood why God says forgive them. And he gave me more light. Then I could see, Larry, I didn't ask you just to forgive them for their sake. I'm asking you to forgive them for your sake. And now you can see them the way I see them. Now you can minister to them. So this person that I hated and wished they were dead, what, did you say that, Pastor? Yeah, I said it because it's the truth. I wanted them out of my life so I wouldn't have to be bothered by them anymore. Then he changed that to, listen, and this is the truth, I love them and would take a bullet for them. They're like a daughter to me. I love her. I want her to come to know Christ. What happened from wanting her out of this world to wanting to spend eternity with them. More light brings more light. More darkness brings more darkness. The darkness with me started this way. I can't believe they slandered me like that. And then it led to this. I can't believe they're stealing from me. I can't believe they're trying to ruin me. And more darkness led to more what? But when I obeyed the truth, and walked in the light, God gave me more light. And when I obey that light, he gives me more, what? Light. And more light. God does not have favorites in the kingdom of God. Amen. We are all on the same playing field. He does have more intimates. And what I mean by that is, the people that obey him and walk with him and walk in truth, he shows more things to. Even if you're struggling in your sin that you're dealing with, whatever that is, he looks at your heart and motives. And if he sees you're trying to move toward the light, guess what he's going to help you do? He's going to give you more light and help you get there. But if you go dark, you're going to go darker. And you'll get to a place you don't even know how you got there. And that's why, Christians, it's so important to guard your heart. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians says. It says, the coming of the Antichrist, the one through the activity of Satan, with all great power to perform all kinds of counterfeit miracles and deceptive signs and false wonders, all of them lies. And by unlimited seduction to evil, and with all the deception of wickedness of those who are perishing, listen to why they're perishing. Listen to why they get deceived. Listen to why they will be condemned to hell, if you will. Because they did not welcome the love of truth so as to be saved. They were spiritually blind and rejected the truth that would have saved them. The last thing I want to close with is there's a divine devotion. So we are defiant in our denial, but God is devoted. I just shared the verse earlier, God's will is that none should perish. And he's drawing all men to himself. And there will be some that with the light that they have, even if, even if it's just the creation and the law that's written on their heart, they will respond by doing what that light shows them. They may not know God, but they know something of the light and they move toward that and God will reveal more. One of my favorite stories is Helen Keller. I saw an old black and white movie of her when I was younger and I remember I'd talking to my mom and I was like, was she really deaf and couldn't talk and, and blind me? Because she, no, she could talk, she was deaf and blind, she, but she couldn't communicate. It's like, that's crazy. And there was a woman that took her time and was persistent and taught her, I think it's called pigeon signing, where you sign everything in the hand so you can feel it. And she began to teach Helen Keller how to come out of that world she'd been enclosed in. Can you imagine being in a world where you can't see, you can't hear, you can only feel and not know what was, she had no concept of anything. And this woman comes into her life and starts to communicate. And then she shares about God and Jesus Christ. And Helen Keller's response was, 
I always knew he was there. I didn't know his name. internal light and she responded to that God has a great devotion for all of us to come to know him and in this passage it says for the gospel of righteousness of God that God is right in what he does and God does what are right is right and does right things the righteousness of God is revealed both springing from faith and leading to faith. That's the way of saying it's disclosed in a way that awakens more faith. As it is written and forever remains written, the just and the upright shall live by faith. Faith to faith. God gives truth. We believe it. We obey it. He gives us more. And the more you obey the light, the more light you get. Listen. Listen. They lived up to the light that they had received, and then more light was given. This is true in history, like people like Lee Strobel and C.S. Lewis. Christopher Hitchinson, which was, a, it was an atheist, who I respected. I respected him, even as an atheist. He was at least objective. At the end of his life, he began responding to light he had been given, and, and he wanted to know more. Now, we don't know whatever happened to him. I'll know when we step off into eternity, but it's a great story. But there's passages in the Bible of people responding to light and God giving more. Cornelius, he's a man in the book of Acts. He is not a Jew. He's a Roman. He's a very successful man. He's a God-fearer. He knows God is out there. He knows the Jews talk about this God. He doesn't know that God, but he responds to the light that he'd been given. And so God sends somebody to Cornelius to show him the rest, the gospel message, and his whole house gets saved because Cornelius was responding to the light that God was given. The Ethiopian that was traveling back, he'd come to Jerusalem. He's a God-fearer. He doesn't even understand God's word. He has the Old Testament, but he doesn't understand it. He, he's seeking to know this God, but he doesn't really know who he is. He wants to know him, and so God sends one of the disciples to go and share with him. He's running alongside the chariot, if you will, and he's reading the book of Isaiah. And the disciple says, hey, do you know what you're reading? He says, how can I know unless somebody helps me? Can I help you understand? Yes. He shares the good news of Jesus Christ. He gets saved. They baptize him right there, and then he goes home. He responded to light. Now, so here's here's the question that we need to ask ourselves. See, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord, Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth in order to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. So that's 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. If we obey the light, God will give you more light. So let me ask you a question. Why would a good God send someone to hell? Is he a tyrant? It's because people reject the truth. They reject him. They want to be left alone to their own devices. They want to do life their way. And God grants them what they wish for. Hell is a place of torment, not just because of the fire and all that. And it's a real place. It's a place where God is not. It's a separation from God. It's a place that was created for Satan as angels. It was not created for man. But when man sinned against God and defiantly reject everything about God and didn't glorify him and did their own thing, they received the same judgment that Satan and them do. So I want you to think about this for a second. There's people in this world I know personally because they come at me all the time. They hate God. They hate Jesus. Do you really think they want to spend eternity with him? They hate him. Why do they hate them? Because they love their darkness. And rather than repent and adjust their life, they rather attack him and those who follow him. And so God's going to give them what they want, life without him. C.S. Lewis said the worst worst part about hell is not the suffering. It's not even the fire. Hell is a place that has nothing of God in it, no love at all, no joy. No peace, no kindness, no goodness. 
no hope because those things are found in God. And that's what they want. God doesn't send people there. They choose to what? Go there. It'd be the equivalent like this. If I said to my daughters, Nikki, Michelle, I will give you a new car. And this is how I'm going to make this possible. I'm going to give it to you as a gift. You can't earn it. All I'm going to ask you to do is just admit that you need me. Well, I'm not going to do that, Dad. Sweetie, just admit it. Everybody knows it. No, I'm not going to admit it. I am my own person, Dad. I need nobody. All right, you don't get the car. And then she goes out and says, you know, I can't believe my dad don't give me a car. Nikki's driving a new car. She said, what are you talking about? He, he said, he gave us everything. He's paying for the insurance. He's putting gas in it. He's done everything. Yeah, but I'm not going to do it. He didn't give it to me. He's got favors. He loves you more. Listen, that's not what the problem is. The problem is one of my kids will not say, Dad, I need you. Oh, how I need you. They will not humble themselves. So does God send anybody to hell or do they choose to go? The second question, what about the ones who haven't heard? How will God judge them? He's going to judge them based on the light that was given. I was told growing up that we were going to go to heaven and God was going to have this big TV screen and every sin I've ever committed was going to be on play for the entire existence of humanity. And I was afraid because I knew what I'd done. And I didn't want some of that stuff played on the VHS player. DVDs today. And I thought God was going to keep a scorecard and just count all my sins. Do you know what he's really, how he's really going to judge? He's going to judge us based on the light that was given. So some of us may have heard the gospel 22 times and totally rejected him. And then there may be a tribesman down in South America who knows there's a God. He sees it. He's aware there's a God. He doesn't know his name, but he's obeyed all the light that he's been given. God's given him more and he's followed. God's going to judge on light. So, so the burning question isn't what is God going to do with those who've not heard? The burning question is what is he going to do with the ones that have? who's had the evidence of creation, their conscience, his law written on their hearts, the knowledge about eternity and light given. That's why Jesus said things like this that were very puzzling to some people. He goes to preach in a city, the city rejects him, and this is what he says. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for this city. Why? Because that city had all of the light come into it, and they rejected him. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have all that light, and they're going to be judged based on the light they have. We will be judged according to the light we have. God is a righteous and good and just judge, and he will judge rightly. And he's going to judge on this, really. What did you do with the light that I gave you? Christian, we need to examine ourselves sometimes because we have more light than anybody else. And we excuse our darkness pretty quick. I've got a hot temper. temper. I'm Irish. I've got Irish stock in me. That's who I am. It's darkness. Own it and say, God, I want to repent and turn from that. God sees all of that, and he loves you so much that he sent Christ to die in your place. So not only can your sins be forgiven, but all those dark choices you've made is wiped clean, made white as what? Snow. And then he says, and then I want to put my spirit into you so that you can walk in the light and be the light like my son is. Those who give their life to Christ, do you know what he calls you? Listen, it's humbling. You're the light of the world. If you've given your life to Christ, you're the light of the world. He goes on to say this, a city cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And instead they put it on its whole stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. Some of y'all think you're in the light and you're not. That's why you're bored at church. I got news for you. It's not me. It's your dark heart because you're self-righteous. Some of you come in the church like some that came in yesterday and they're afraid to come in the church. They're scared the church is going to fall into them. I tell you, they're closer to heaven than some of you. How can you say that, Larry? Because Jesus said that. There's a man that came in and said, God, I'm so happy that I am right with you. This is Larry paraphrase. I'm so glad I'm not like the rest of these lost people. I live right and I do right. That's why I'm so blessed. God, thank you that you made me that way. And then there's a man in the back who knew he was a sinner. Couldn't even bring his head to look up and he beat on his chest and said, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went home justified. Not this one. Because that one responded to the light. Does that make sense, church? How are we responding to the light? Let's pray. Come on, give you something to think about before we leave here. We have all been given light. We all have been shown things. And if truth be told, we know what's right. We just willfully choose not to. And I pray for all of us that we would see how dangerous that is. Because darkness leads to more darkness. Father, your word tells us that we are your children and that you're our shepherd and that you lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Your word also says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are asking that you would do a work in our heart and revive us that we would walk in the light as Christ is in the light. Lord, I pray that you would just be with us and help us to really examine ourselves today. Father, some of us are just struggling with sins, and we are really struggling. We want to do right. Father, I pray that you would encourage them that they realize they are trying to choose light over darkness and that you would give them your grace to do what is right. Father, some of us, we've never even thought about the fact that you love us so much that you've made every way possible for us to enter into your eternity, into heaven, and we just don't understand. I pray that you would move those people to come and either talk to me or someone in this church about how do I come to know Christ, that I could be set free so that we would not be afraid like a child in a car, but that we would walk confidently in you. Help us to leave here thinking about are we walking in the light in darkness and help us to repent in Jesus name we pray and all God's people said amen, amen. we're going to close with him 344 and we're going to stand and sing if you're here today and you want to know Christ and you want to know how this how this works how do I receive this gift the Bible tells us we ask for it those who call will be saved but you come and grab me and I will spend the day with you now I've got to meet Jojo and them at one o'clock but I will make them wait if you want, want to know how to get saved. So let's stand and sing and do what the Lord leads you to do. Hymn 344.